So my name is Takata from uh, Samo Physical Pro Properties Division of AISNA. Uh, today uh, we have a, a guest speaker from KAIST, uh, Professor Sanyon Lee. I briefly introduce uh, him. Uh, he graduated from uh, Seoul National University in 1974, and then he graduated, uh, get a master co degree in from KAIST in 1960, uh, 1976. And after that, he uh, got received a PhD from uh, Northwestern University in 1982. Uh, since then, he uh, joined the, as a faculty member of uh, KAIST, Department of Mechanical Engineering. And he is uh, uh, working for in the field of uh, a two-phase flow. Uh, and he uh, is a member of uh, KSME, ASME. And in 2000, Oh, nine. So he served as the president of Korean uh, Society of Mechanical Engineers, KSME. So uh, he is uh, the. Uh, uh, I I uh, have been. Uh, ha I I have known him personally uh, for long uh, years ago. For instance, I. We met in Creta Island in 2003, okay? And we, uh, we meet uh, many places in the world. So uh, actually, uh, he is uh, the uh, top uh, scientist in the uh, heat transfer community in the world. So the, uh, today's uh, his talk is uh, two-phase flow distribution in heat exchangers. So I'd like to invite Professor Lee. Please start. Well, thank you very much for a nice introduction. And uh, today I was very much impressed uh, by uh, this campus because I looked around this campus and saw that many really new uh, research is going on. And uh, I think uh, you will have very successful result uh, hereafter. But today I'd like to talk about some materials which is somehow a little bit like uh, old things compared to what you're working on here with Eisner, but uh, I think still it's very important because the industry application is uh, very important with that uh, two-phase flow distribution heat exchangers. So uh, where well, this uh, view graph shows just the, uh, uh, the, uh, the outside of that, the uh, KAIST campus, and where well, uh, this is quite a newly built campus, but we moved from uh, Seoul to Daejeon, which is about two hour drive from uh, Seoul in south direction. And uh, we moved to this place about uh, 20 years ago. So uh, we have uh, approximately the, uh, the uh, same uh, situation. But the contents of our presentation is very simple because I'd like to talk about some elementary things on the two-phase flow distribution at a single T-junction because uh, that actually consists uh, the, uh, the overall the heat exchanger in this case. But where, uh, with that uh, single T-junction case, we cannot actually design the uh, overall heat exchanger. So that's why you'd like to look into what is the interaction between a multiple T-junction, like two junctions together, and then you'd like to look into multiple parallel junction and finally, we would like to talk about uh, the, some effective parameters uh, for the uh, heat exchanger system. Then I'd like to show just the various uh, techniques to improve distribution inside that uh, evaporators and some condensers. Then we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the flow distribution in uh, micro heat exchangers, and then I can conclude uh, uh, the talk today. So this is just introduction background, and probably uh, most of you know that the heat exchanger design target is to maximize heat transfer performance uh, between two streams which has uh, different temperatures to each other. And of course, we would like to avoid so-called 
merge distribution. So if you have like a very bad distribution inside the heat exchanger, then that actually uh, make non-uniform temperature difference between one fluid and another, and that will degrade the heat transfer performance. And of course, that merge distribution is caused by mechanical uh, causes. For example, if it's not well manufactured, or if you have some uh, failure in the system, mechanically, then that, of course, that will cause flow mole distribution. And also, you may have like a self-induced mole distribution that, cause, that is caused by the uh, change of the heat transfer process. And the third thing is, we have like a two-phase mole distribution, because if you are dealing with uh, heat transfer in uh, evaporators and condensers, then liquid and gas have different in density and also viscosity, and that is mainly the cause of mole distribution. And of course, uh, we have like a fouling, fouling cause mole distribution because where, when the system is really new, then it was okay. But if time goes by, then you will have like fouling or scaling inside that uh, heat exchanger, then that may cause the, uh, the, some of the flow path is blocked and you may cause uh, this type of the mole distribution. Anyhow, uh, we would like to talk, co concentrate, uh, concentrate our talk on that uh, two-phase mole distribution. So that means you would like to talk about evaporator and condensers, especially we would like to talk about the evaporator in this case. Of course, uh, we are talking about evaporator and condensers, then you have like a large scale uh, where evaporator and condensers, like in uh, power plants or chemical plants or some district heating system, but it is not uh, the subject we are going to talk, but you would like to concentrate on small scale or micro scale. Where small scale means in this case, uh, we are going to talk about, especially on the uh, compact heat exchangers, uh, especially for um, air conditioning refrigeration system, but these days we would like to make that heat transfer equipment, which is very small. So uh, sometimes we are coming down to a meso scale or micro scale for electronics cooling and also fuel cell reformer, and uh, where this is micro channel evaporator and condensers. So uh, we are going to uh, talk about this uh, step by step. Now what you see here is just very typical uh, cycle of refrigeration. So here you have pressure and enthalpy diagram and here you have saturate curve over here. And you have uh, point one, two, three, and four. Each actor represent point one, two, and three, and four. So between point one and two, you have here evaporators, and you have two phase mixture coming out from the expansion valve and introduced to the, the header. And then that is distributed into a parallel channels, and you have intermediate header, and then that distribute into again, parallel channels, and so on. Then where the, the mixture is uh, well converted into uh, the vapor, okay, sometimes like a saturated vapor, or sometimes it's superheated vapor, then it goes through that compressor through the uh, isentropic process, and then finally you have a high pressure superheated vapor which is going into the condenser, and again you have here uh, where uh, inlet header and parallel channel and intermediate header, and then again you have uh, the uh, parallel channel and so on. Then outside of that, the condenser, this is subcooled liquid state, and that is going through that expansion valve uh, through that isentalpic process, and then finally you're coming back to uh, point one. So in this case, the important thing is, can you actually make this evaporator and condenser the flow uh, distribution uh, in very uniform way. And that is our purpose. Or at least, can we control that flow distribution to each channel? And of course, in this case, we have to think about what is the uh, role of air outside. And of course, we have to think about flow pattern inside that heat exchanger. All right, so in this case, uh, we have mostly the condenser of that uh, air conditioning system is very much uh, uh, like a standardized because usually it has vertical headers with horizontal multiple channels. But in case of ev evaporators, we have many different designs 
Uh, for example, all the other things are the same, but evaporate section is changing. For example, to uh, they improve that distribution, you place here a distributor or maybe a couple of distributor, and then where that two-phase mixture coming in uh, from the expansion valve and then uh, were distributed into small channels or capillaries, and then uh, that is introduced to each individual uh, parallel channels, and that actually improve the uh, flow distribution over here. But all the other uh, things are the same. Or if you are working on like a small microchannel evaporator, then here again you have like an inlet header and you have outlet header, and between them you have multiple parallel channels which has very small, like a several tens of micron size or like a several hundreds uh, micron size over here. And where in this case also flow distribution problem is quite important and especially when you're dealing with like a micron size or uh, like a several tens of micron size, then uh, you have chance to actually uh, the bubble to occupy the entire the flow area so uh, that may cause kind of some uh, flow instability inside. So that's why we have the very good reason to uh, look into this problem together. So just uh, let's into, uh, look into the condenser from the beginning. This is just typical type of condenser you have. And you have here like a header. This type, this is the header. Actually, we uh, open, uh, cut the header. And you can see that there's small rectangular channel divided by membranes to have sub-channels. And so flow is coming in and then going through this parallel channel and then uh, where that goes to the uh, intermediate channel and going out uh, through that another uh, series of parallel channel. And uh, that kind of design and especially where do we have to put this type of uh, uh, dividing uh, plate uh, in this uh, type of uh, header and channel assembly. Where in case of flow distribution and condensers, where at the condenser inlet, mostly superheated vapor or a high void flow is introduced. And so in this case, uh, is, this is actually the flow distribution problem is less serious compared to the evaporator. But uh, there is still problems like if you have high liquid loading at a certain location of that uh, condenser, then that actually makes a low heat transfer and that will cause uneven temperature distribution. And also another thing is that even for the single vapor flow introduced to the condenser, where you may have different flow paths, like flow lengths, and also you may have like a, some a geometric complications, like you have flow restrictions, then that also causes flow mole distribution. And of course, if you have intermediate headers, then that also makes the flow very much complicated. And so this is just one uh, very important thing we have to think about with uh, condenser in flow distribution. Uh, let's see uh, what happens with like a con uh, evaporator. Where here, this is assembly of evaporator that you can find from your automobiles. That is in the, uh, the front of the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the compartment and the passenger seat. And here you have here dimpled aluminum plate and those two plates are combined together with aluminum fin between them. And if you, they combine this way, and then finally you can assemble this type of uh, heat exchanger, the evaporator. Then where flow is, two-phase mixtures introduced uh, over here, and those two holes are actually uh, forming a header portion. Then where two-phase mixtures coming in, then coming down, and go to the back side and going up, and then go to another side, and then coming down, going up, and then finally it leaves that e the evaporator. An important thing is that uh, how to construct that flow circuit uh, in this case. For example, here again, flow is coming in, going down, and going up in the back side, and going uh, along that header, and then coming down and going up, and so on. Where this type of flow circuit uh, makes the, the flow, uh, the temperature distribution outside heat exchanger very much different. For example, you can see that some portion of the heat exchanger is not really cold enough, and that actually makes that outside air temperature uh, very much different from place to place. So 
So if you'd like to make that air temperature, the even the uniform distribution, then you have to re uh, uh, find out what is the proper uh, path or circuit for the refrigerant. And if you make it proper circuit, then you will find out that uniform distribution uh, of that uh, heat exchanger. And where well, actually this shows that this is one uh, uh, where uh, uh, type of the circuit which shows non-uniform distribution of air outside heat exchanger. But if you make the proper circuit, then you will have uh, uniform temperature distribution of the air once you pass that air for cooling. Well, this is uh, one another example that if you have non-uniform distribution, then sometimes frost forms at the outside. And once frost is formed, then it blocks the path for the air and the flow that heat transfer performances even becomes worse. So in this case, we have to avoid this kind of situation. So the best thing is to, even though you have like a, a freezing or a frost formation, it's good to have uniform uh, frosting condition to make that uh, defrosting period uh, as long as possible, all right? So in this case, this is what we'd like to avoid. So in case of evaporator, at the header inlet, usually the expansion valve, outside the expansion valve, we have two-phase mixture coming out with low quality. But uh, well, evaporator is usually in a low pressure condition, and that means we have large difference between liquid and gas in density and also viscosity. So that means you have like a high void fraction in that case, and where that actually causes large uh, flow mold distribution. And also here we have like, like problems, like if you have improper distribution of the liquid phase, then some portion of that heat exchanger uh, inside, you have dry out occurs, and if you have dry out occurs, then you have poor heat uh, transfer, and that is not really uh, not uh, uh, like a expected uh, case for good design. And also flow orientation is quite important because mostly when you are uh, designing that evaporator, then it's good to have parallel channels, heat exchanger channels, uh, where uh, uh, oriented vertically because you have outside the condensate and for easy drain of the condensate, it's good to have vertical channel with horizontal headers. But where well, sometimes it's not always because usually air conditioning system is used in summertime, but we would like to convert same system for heat pump for heating in the winter time. Then the outdoor unit, which usually uh, uh, carries the uh, condenser, is operated as an evaporator in the summer, uh, winter time. And in the winter time, outside temperatures nearly like zero, de zero degrees Celsius, so you have to make outside outdoor unit below the uh, freezing point. Then in that case, the uh, evaporator, which used to be condenser in the summertime, uh, should be operated with vertical, uh, the, the horizontal channel with vertical header. So where well, this type of design cannot be often used in heating case. And also flow becomes complicated at the intermediate header as what we can see from the, uh, the condenser. And if you come to uh, like micro channel, then you have inlet header and outlet header and you have here a small uh, several hundreds uh, of microns or several tens of microns. And where here you have all different design of this one. And again, the flow mode distribution is quite important in this case. So uh, what do we do uh, to uh, find out, to predict the flow distribution problem in the heat exchanger? Well, here in the right-hand side, you have, a he you have header and you have parallel channels. And between them, of course, you have a uh, fin. Then where this he uh, header and channel assembly can be considered as the accumulation of single T-junction. So this is one elementary unit and you have here two-phase mixtures coming in, and part of the two-phase mixture is going up through the side branch, and the rest amount is going to the run. And here we call, this is the main, this is branch, and this is the run. So if you accumulate two T-junction, then 
outside of the run becomes in in uh, outlet of the uh, run becomes inlet of the main, and you have like a second second branch and second run and so on. So if you accumulate that T junction until the end plate is met, then uh, you have here multiple parallel channels. So it's very natural that you start from single T junction study and then goes to two parallel junctions, and then we can go to multiple parallel junctions very systematically. So let's, let's start from single T junction case. But before that, uh, there's another approach when you are using flow distributor. Then this design of this uh, flow distributor and also selection of capillary tubes to each channel is another subject we have to look into. Anyhow, let's just go to the single T-junction case, where in case of evaporators or in many uh, heat exchangers, where even though you have low quality at the inlet, flow is very flow has very high void fraction. So that means flow pattern is easily to be annular flow or annular mist flow. So uh, this is just typical experimental setup what you can construct. Well, here you supply liquid from the side and you supply air or vapor from the side and two-phase mixture, the air flow, air annular flow is formed and then flow through that test section through the main. And then it goes to the run and branch and we control here valves in the run side and valves in the branch side. So what you control is that if you open, well, if you make that valve opening a little bit large in run side, then you close valve opening, like a reduced valve opening in the branch side to reduce uh, the, the remain, the, uh, the, uh, the, the pressure at the junctions are uh, the same. Then you can actually control amount of flow going out to the branch or going out to the run. So here, this is just typical type of uh, result you can get. In this graph, the x-axis shows that fraction of gas separated to the branch and this fraction of liquid separated the branch. So here, if you see this definition a little bit carefully, fraction of gas separated means where this is ratio between the gas flow rate to the branch and this is gas flow rate uh, in the main. And so uh, where this is the fraction of gas separated to the branch and this is fraction of liquid separated branch means this is the ratio uh, of the uh, uh, flow rate of liquid to the branch and this is flow rate uh, of the liquid in the main. So if you are in this diagonalized line, that means quality inside the main and quality inside the branch are the same, right? So if you have data point in above that, the diagonal line, then that means more amount of liquid is split out to the branch. Or if you stay here below that diagonal line, then you have more vapor going into the branch side. And where uh, we, if you have like a small amount of total flow rate to the branch, then most of data should stay over here. And if you have more amount of fluid going to the, uh, the branch, then most of data stays over here. So this is just typical result what you can get. So if you have low flow rate going to the branch, then uh, where usually the, uh, the in annular flow, liquid is creeping along the wall. So if you have side opening, then easy, that's easy for that liquid film to just branching out. So that's why you have large flow rate of liquid to the branch. But if you have higher uh, flow rate uh, to the run in total, and then, uh, uh, no, sorry, higher flow rate to the branch, then you have chance for that liquid film to drag by that, uh, the, uh, the gas and it actually flows into uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the gas is flowing out to the, uh, the branch, and so that's why it stays uh, below this diagonal line. And this, uh, the results show that, where this is for the experiment with vertical uh, flow in this uh, header and channel, and this is for the horizontal flow, and this is for the square channel, and this is for the round channel, but results seems very much similar together, so what we can say is that where in case of like small channel case, then the flow direction and also cross-sectional shape has very small effect on the branching problem. Well, 
when you like to predict the flow rate to the branch, then uh, this is uh, the typical way of modeling. For example, this is just cross-section of the, uh, the uh, that's the main side, and you can see that you have liquid film along the wall, and you have vapor, of course, plus some entrained droplet in the core portion. Then some portion of liquid and gas is branched off or just split off here. Then you have this portion, it was actually hatched like that, but uh, that portion is termed to be zone of influence. And fluid in zone of influence is split it off, and so main uh, uh, the, the course of this kind of modeling is to find out here that the shape of, the arc shape of this dividing streamline. So uh, where in this case, you have to uh, write down some momentum equation for that to find what is that radius of curvature, and then once you get this shape, uh, the dividing streamline, then finally you can find out how much amount of fluid is contained in this zone of influence compared to the overall amount of that uh, fluid in the main tube. But in this case, uh, where the liquid dividing streamline and vapor or gas dividing streamline were assumed to be the same, but it doesn't have to be. So that's why you can allow that streamline for gas and liquid can be differentiated. So that's why here the Shoham improved the model, uh, original model by Azopardi Azo by uh, just introducing different uh, the strip dividing spring line for gas and liquid. And then uh, you can just make uh, this type of model. Like here, the one streamline for the gas and another streamline for the liquid. And uh, that model has been developed and different uh, radius of curvature was modeled there. And then finally, the, the Huang uh, and also the, uh, the professors at Lay's group in RPI improved this model and take into account of like balance between centrifugal force and, and so on. Then uh, finally he uh, take into account of that, uh, all that, uh, the force effect to uh, find out the dividing streamline. And later here, uh, Watanabe uh, also uh, considered that the motion of droplet in entrained uh, vapor or gas, and where if you have entrained a droplet, then uh, that is dragged by that ambient vapor, and some portion of droplet will be uh, dragged to the uh, branch side, and that model has been uh, improved. So when you are using uh, basically Huang's model, and we run the experiment, uh, to check whether Huang's model is right or not, because Huang's model was originally developed for large tube system, but we try that with a smaller tube system, and also we compare with some others uh, the small tube system, and then found out that that is quite reasonable. So uh, the Huang's model is actually uh, quite useful in predicting the branching flow rate in case of single T junction, and where this is actually. Uh, the uh, final result, which actually de determines uh, the, uh, uh, the shape of that arc of the, uh, the dividing streamline here. Well then, uh, once you get uh, how to uh, obtain that, uh, the single T-junction case, then we can move to uh, two different T-junction, or right, so two consecutive T-junction. So let's say that you have two uh, rectangular junctions connected to this header. Then for this second junction, if you have uh, another junction in upstream side, then flow will be affected, right? So if you have here uh, at far upstream, uh, a portion of liquid and gas is branched out in the first channel. And then you will have some where non-symmetric type of uh, the liquid film in branching side is actually proceeding the second branch. And so you will have less amount of liquid is going out to the second branch. And so uh, we have tested uh, different uh, spacing between those two uh, rectangular channels. For example, if channel one and channel two is really far away, then uh, second channel is not really affected by existence of first channel. So what you see is, uh, this is the, uh, the result with 
a single T-junction case. But if you reduce the distance between those two channels, and that becomes uh, farther and farther from the single phase, single T-junction case. And so, where in this case, we can uh, where include that effect uh, by modifying that Huang's model by introducing here some correction factor, which is function of uh, distance between two rectangular channels. And then where that practically gives you a very good result uh, for uh, using that uh, model by uh, uh, the Huang's in this case. All right, so uh, where you can actually resolve two consecutive channels in the case. So if you uh, extend these things with really multiple parallel channels, in, and then what will happen? So here we made another experiment with end plate, and here you have main and two phase mixtures coming in, and we have uh, two channel one, two, and then up to uh, 15 parallel channels, and we looked into uh, the phenomena, what happens over here. So what you do is, again, we are using similar kind of experiment. So uh, where air is su uh, the, uh, supplied and liquid is supplied over here, and then two phase mixture is uh, introduced at the in entrance of this header channel assembly. And here, this is uh, the transparent header we have, and rectangular 15 rectangular channels are located horizontally. Then we collected amount of uh, liquid and gas at the downstream. Then what you see is, uh, well, let me just uh, show you some uh, movie, how it really looks like. And where two-phase mixture is flowing here, and this kind of some annular flow, but uh, you can see that where there's very much like a oscillating motion over here, and we are collecting gas and liquid at the downstream of those channels. And so, uh, of course, this is just a real-time uh, picture, but uh, we are collecting that liquid and gas flow rate at the downstream for a certain period of time. So that means the time average value shows a certain trend. For example, uh, when you are uh, looking into uh, the case with uh, some uh, detailed <coughs> figures here, for example, in this region A, where if you are actually uh, far enough from that, uh, the end plate, then where flow rate is the flow rate to the branch is decreasing as you go downstream direction. And that's very natural because, again, uh, some amount of fluid is going out to the first branch, and then the rest amount is going to the second branch, but where the distance between those two branches are not far enough, so that's why flow rate is decreasing uh, through that second and third and fourth branch. But if you look into uh, region B, next region over here, then you can see here some crossover of the flow through the center of the pipe. And then the flow rate through the branch, to like from uh, uh, the branch five, six, seven, eight or so, then flow rate is increasing through the branch. And if you go further to the, uh, the last part, then the uh, flow rate is again decreasing. And if you just carefully look into uh, this kind of thing, uh, you, if you take time and then Finally, you can just sketch the flow pattern here. For example, in region A, where flow is going in this way, and so you have a flow going out through the branch like that, and so a flow rate decreases in a header direction. But where you have a rest for a part of that a flow is affected by this end plate, so that's why it actually carries the liquid all the way up over here and you have crossover here, and then you have here recirculating regions, something like that. So you, two streams are colliding over here, so that's why you have a crossover there along the cross section. So uh, that's why you have flow rate going in, a uh, flow going in this direction. So this is decreasing in upward direction, and this is decreasing in downward direction, or like a downstream direction. So that's why you have this type of uh, the flow rate to the branch. So where what we know is that this region A is uh, quite possible to uh, predict by using Huang's model, or if you modify that by taking account of distance between the branches. But for region N, B, and C, 
that is still in trouble because here you have high oscillation as you have seen that and uh, this portion is still uh, not really predictable by using like elementary approach. So this is a kind of some uh, empirical thing, uh, the a way you have to find out how to make uh, uniform distribution. So this is just uh, what we have uh, practiced. Now, uh, if you take account of, again, in this case, this is the work done by the Watanabe, and where for this T-junction, uh, if you model this T-junction, and also if you uh, make that a pressure drop in evaporator tube, and also you have, if you have like a straight pipe, vertical pipe, and if you model all three different parts, then you can actually get that uh, flow rate uh, split to the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the branch can be obtained quite reasonably. But in this case, if you are approaching to the top, where you should, they, they should have here like end plate because you cannot make it the header size infinitely long. But in that case, the flow rate is going up like that. But we're here uh, in this situation, the pressure drop uh, along that, the channel is usually quite large. So that's why that role of this uh, junction is somehow like underestimated. So that's why it looks like uh, it really fits quite well. So uh, where we have looked into some of the model and the phenomena, so, but uh, in real cases, uh, what is really the effective parameters? Where we have to look into inlet condition uh, to the header, and also we have to look into some geometry of the uh, header, and also channel geometry and condition should be considered, and intermediate header role should be uh, considered uh, carefully. So what you see is, you can change this many parameters, like you have changed the size, cross-section shape, and inlet direction, and inlet ori uh, the, uh, header uh, orientation, and number of junction, and so on. But where we can just find out some important major parameters we have to think about. Where, for example, in case of inlet to the headers, flow regime is really important. Where the other things really affects that the flow distribution, but that is relatively minor. And so flow control flow regime is really prime important. And also uh, orientation of the, uh, the header is important. Sometimes you have vertical header, or sometimes you have a horizontal header, and that determines the flow distribution quite a lot. And also another thing is that inlet direction is important. Where what inlet direction means, you can introduce two-phase mixture from the bottom, or you can introduce it from the side, or you can introduce that from the front. But that also determines that flow distribution. So those two are important factors in geometry of the header. And also channel geometry, again, the channel orientation is important, whether it is vertical or horizontal. And also, where you cannot make that the assemble channel and header exactly as a flush mount shape. So all the time you have some intrusion depth to the, channel, uh, the header, and that actually makes the uh, flow distribution very much different. And this is what I'm going to tell a little bit more afterwards. And also, you may have flow oscillations in the channel, and uh, that is what you have to prevent. And of course, you have flow regime problem in intermediate header. So uh, what just I'd like to tell you is, this is quite a difficult problem. And if you go to industry, actually, I spent uh, industry last year uh, in LG Electronics, and they are trying to make that flow distribution as uniform as possible, but that is more than uh, engineering. It's something like an R, because they are trying this and that, and uh, uh, where I'll show you some of the examples uh, with uh, various things. For example, uh, where I already mentioned that inlet flow patterns is important flow for flow distribution. So if you place here orifice or module at the nozzle uh, at the header inlet, then in that case, the flow pattern inside the header becomes homogeneous flow. If you make that homogeneous uh, flow and mixture, then you have tendency to have more uniform distribution. So this is without nozzle. So you have like uh, channel one, two, three, four, five, and you have very different flow distribution. But you place here nozzle, then it is actually improved. So where inlet channel 
uh, in that uh, the uh, uh, condition, like placing here the nozzle is very effective way to do that. That is good side, but bad side is, of course, you increase pressure draw. That is what you have to compromise. Another thing is, if you place this type of uh, the baffle inside the header, then also that will help. And what you see is this is the inlet of the header. And just uh, near the inlet of the header, the hole sizes are very small. So that gives you higher friction or flow restriction. But if you go far from that, the inlet header, then you have larger holes. So here the important information is that how to choose the hole size and how to choose distance between the hole size. And that is really patented in many uh, uh, heat exchangers. This is uh, another uh, design. For example, this is the typical uh, design of the evaporator uh, in automobile. Here you have two phase mixture intrudes over here and then coming down and then go to along that header in intermediate header. But here you place here an orifice which has different size uh, in hole and then it after that it goes up and then go to the back side and coming down. And then here you follow that header side with also different hole size of orifice. And then it goes up and going up. Now the thing is here where to locate those nozzles or holes. And also what is the size of the hole? That is again a patented item for this type of flow distribution. Where there's a several different things. Like here you have header, but you place another tube with side opening. So two-phase mixture is introduced over here. Then it flows to the first chamber, second chamber, third chamber, fourth chamber. And then that is again divided into uh, so parallel channels. And that will help that uh, distribution uniform, uh, make the, uh, the distribution quite uniform. Or you can make it the header cross section smaller and smaller as it goes downstream wise. And in this case, of course, the ratio of the, uh, the cross-sectional area uh, from one place to another is, again, very important uh, information uh, which should be uh, patented here. And one another example is, again, you can put here like a porous material. And porous material has high uh, the frictional pressure drop. So, and that makes the pressure inside that uh, distributor relatively uniform uh, compared to the case without porous media. And so you can make flow distribution quite uniform. This is another type of thing, like you have inlet header here, and this is outlet header. So inlet, near to the inlet header, you have small holes and larger holes, and the, uh, far from that inlet header, and going down in this way, and then coming up, then where the outside header you have here, small nozzle holes over here. And that again helps this, uh, uh, the uniform distribution. And uh, this has been patented by the, uh, the uh, Japanese uh, engineers. Where uh, this is one way of also improving that, uh, the uh, flow distribution. As I already mentioned that uh, there's very uh, big influence by the intrusion depth. For example, this is the, the header, and you have like a parallel channel. But here, you have some intrusion depth with value h, for example. If value h is zero, then you make like a very uh, flat uh, uh, the, uh, surface of this the channel side. In this case, you have more chance of uh, liquid to flow to the first channel, and the second channel, and third channel, and so on. So flow distribution shows in this shape. But uh, if you have like a very large intrusion depth, then liquid cannot go through the uh, channel one easily. So it carries to second and third and fourth. So that's why you have flow of liquid actually accumulated near that the end plate. So that's why, that's why that the flow rate actually shows this shape. So you may easily, uh, easily imagine that if you control that intrusion depth, then you may have very even distribution to each channel. So where we tried several different uh, intrusion depths, like uh, 0 millimeter, 6 millimeter, 12 millimeter, something like that, 
then finally could find out that uh, where it shows like a uniform distribution. So this is the flow pattern you see. Here this is zero intrusion depth. Then flow is mostly going out to the, uh, the front channels. And if you have very large the intrusion depth, then there's more liquid over here. But if you control the intrusion depth, then you can have quite uniform flow rate through that. All right? So that is one thing uh, you can achieve. And where, again, the important thing is that how to determine that intrusion depth and uh, the get the experimental result. Where another way of uh, imp improving that flow distribution is, uh, first, you separate liquid and gas at the distributor. For example, if you have two-phase mix mixture coming in, and if you have here a chamber, then where liquid is all just settled down in the bottom side, and you have vapor at the upper side, and then you have vapor coming in through that the hole at the top, and liquid is coming in through the hole at the sides, and so that's why you can make a gas and liquid distribution quite evenly. And where this kind of concept also can be applied for the case with uh, using here nozzle, and you have vapor flow. So first you uh, divide the gas and liquid first, and then let the uh, vapor flow in through the tube, and liquid uh, through this uh, nozzle or sprinkler, and then you can make even distribution. Or you uh, let the liquid coming in through the tube, and you use bubbler to make distribution. And this is for like relatively large size exchanger you can use. Where well, this is a way of using like a distributor. And again, in this case, where two phase mixtures are coming in, but you place here orifice and make the flow like the homogeneous flow. And then that means conical shape of that uh, flow. And then finally divide into here like uh, eight or sometimes 10 or sometimes 12 uh, small uh, tubes, which was drilled like axisymmetrically. So it gives you quite good distribution. And this is another type of uh, the distributor. And here, the distance between end of this pipe and uh, bottom of this plate is quite important to determine. But here, anyway, if that goes through that, uh, that neck, and then finally, it distributed through the small holes drilled axisymmetrically, uh, which was done by the uh, Vogels uh, some time ago. And uh, we did a similar kind of thing last year in the industry, of course. And we, are, we have to actually try uh, the, uh, the flow distribution from this main channel to the capillary tubes and then finally to the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, heat exchanger channel. So we are constructing uh, this type of loop, but you cannot ac actually make that uh, condenser and evaporator a size large because you need large heating source and also you need a large cooling source. So that's why uh, we let the heat exchange between condenser, condenser and evaporator just directly to save energy. Then and what we have is from seven to eight, we have compressor unit. And then from one to two here, we have a cooling of the uh, superheated vapor. And then from 0.2 to three in this condensing portion, we actually uh, that uh, remove heat uh, by using that uh, evaporator. And then here at the, uh, three and four, we use cooling water to control the condition at 0.4. Then let uh, it, uh, the two-phase, uh, the subcool liquid uh, pass through that expansion valve. And then we have test section over here. So uh, we measure that uh, flow rate to each uh, uh, the uh, capillary at the downstream by controlling the valve and the downstream. And uh, we could get a result, something like here, the total pressure drop through the branch. Like we have pressure drop between the inlet and outlet of this uh, distributor, then that consists of reversible pressure component and irreversible pressure component. And reversible pressure component is something like a, uh, you can get from like a Bernoulli type equation. But here, irreversible part is due to the frictional pressure drop here. So you have here pressure coefficient KD for the single phase and then introduce two phase frictional multiplier. And this type of correlation could be obtained for uh, this type of distributor. And currently we are working on how to 
generalize this type of correlation for practical use. Well, then, uh, let me just touch a little bit about the flow distribution in micro DD exchangers because uh, that is quite important in electron cooling. So, uh, this is the real the size of the uh, micro channel heat exchanger. And in case of single phase flow, even in this case, uh, you have to uh, look into what happens inside the heat exchanger. Very important uh, rule of design is that the cross section of that uh, header should be larger than some of the cross section of that each individual channel. All right. So this is what uh, the first thing. And then you have to uh, minimize the pressure of that header or manifolds because you would like to make the conditions here, the pressure almost uniform. Then you can make it a uh, flow distribution quite uniform. And this is the way, this is the parallel flow manifold because inlet header direction, the flow inside, inside the inlet header and flow it outlet, outlet header is the same. So that is what we call parallel flow. And reverse flow is that is coming in this way but going it in reverse way. And here, uh, reverse manifold uh, gives you better configuration for single phase flow. This is just the experimental result. And then, of course, in uh, parallel manifolds, maximum flow rate occurs at the first channel. But in case of reverse flow, maximum flow rate occurs at the last channel, and where control of the manufacturing tolerance is quite important. Well, what happens in two-phase flow is more complicated because once you have a bubble formed inside the channel, then once bubble is formed, then where, uh, it's very difficult to find a bubbly flow in small micro channel, so uh, it immediately fills the total cross-section of that micro channel. Then, that pushes liquid in both directions. And you may experience like a reverse flow locally. And that causes flow instability. And if you have that flow instability, then some portion is actually dried out. And if that dries out, then uh, that portion is very bad in heat transfer performance. So that's why uh, control of that, uh, the flow instability is important. So uh, where this is one example studies by uh, Professor Kandelika in RIT, and he did some numerical experiment how that bubble grows inside the channel numerically, and this is observation what they did uh, inside that, uh, the, uh, the micro channel of two phase exchanges, and uh, he could see that uh, liquid is expelled in both directions. So to reduce uh, flow, reverse flow and flow oscillations, what he suggested was that why don't we make that inlet channel smaller compared to the outlet of the channel? Then even though you have uh, the liquid expelled in both directions, but you have higher uh, the restriction in the upstream, so you have more tendency to have like a forward flow there. So this is uh, uh, the thing uh, people did. And uh, another thing uh, we have to talk about is if you're coming down to microchannel flow, then mostly uh, flow rate, uh, the, uh, the flow split to the branches mostly determined by the size of the channel and also uh, by the uh, flow rate at the main. But important thing is that even though you have same flow rate at the upstream, you may have uh, short bubbles or you may have long bubbles. And that affects that the, uh, the branching ratio. That is because the first thing is that, uh, well, the plug flow is very often observed in uh, this type of small channel, and bubble length plays quite important role. So uh, let me just show uh, what we did for this type of experiment. So we are supplying uh, different lengths of bubbles with the same flow rate, and then uh, we measured uh, the flow rate to the branch and run by controlling the bubble length. And we actually changed the bubble length from well, like 1.6 multiplied by the hydroelectric diameter. And then we uh, also made the bubble length with about 100 times uh, of that hydroelectric diameter, very long bubbles. Then, uh, where well, this is a typical picture, you can see that when long bubble is coming in, then they are actually split it with almost the same ratio in the, uh, the main channel. But you have like a short bubbles coming in, then it shows 
uh, very much different behavior. Even uh, if you can the, uh, separate the uh, faces by controlling bubble length and also flow rate. So sometimes you can let uh, you can have that bubbles going to the run only, or you can have bubble going to the branch only. So flow separation may occur. So what you have is result is that if you have long bubbles, then in this case you stay almost in the diagonal line of the graph what I have explained. But you have short bubbles, then that is very far from uh, the diagonalized line. So that means bubble length should be counted very seriously in case of microchannel flow. Well, so uh, uh, let me just uh, briefly uh, summarize what I have talked. Where that uh, we have talked about the uh, simplification and uh, building block approach. So we first talk about the single T junction, and then we talked about uh, two junctions uh, were located consecutively. And then we talked about header to parallel channel. And then we talked about some pa parametric effect and various techniques to achieve the, uh, the uh, uniform flow distribution. But what is left to do? Well, the thing is that modeling of configuration near the end plate is still trouble. So we need something for uh, uh, resolve that kind of problem and also Effect of fluid property is important, especially if you are coming down to small scale, then uh, the capillary effect is also uh, very important. And also, uh, in case of non-annular flow case in the main, in small T junction, then uh, that is also a topic we have to look into that very carefully. And finally, two-phase flow instability should be considered seriously. So I think uh, this is the main part of my talk. And before closing, I just have to uh, say thank you to Professor Takada for inviting me to the seminar. And this is what we have taken at the Crete Island in 2003. And here you can see uh, Professor Takada. And this is uh, one old graveyard in Crete Island. And if I remember correctly, that is like BC 17th century or so. So this is almost like 4,000 years ago, but they still they keep this kind of thing. And uh, I don't have my uh, mustache over here. That's uh, like a, I was my younger date. And here you can see Professor Takada, very tidy and very smart. And here's another one. Uh, two years later, and we are uh, two years older now. And this was what I've taken at Whistler in Canada. But this is the same conference series. And this is Professor Rose, you may know, uh, in uh, University of London. And this is myself, this is Professor Takada, and this is Professor Kim. He was the conference chair of last uh, GSME, KSME, uh, at the Thermal and Fluid Engineering Conference. And so again, uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer your question or comments. Thank you very much. <laughs>